thank you all very much for coming to the launch of the 2016 Socialist Register. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here, uh, especially at this great venue, which has been uh, so kind to have us here year after year to launch the Register. Uh, I feel like I should apologize. Uh, people keep telling me that it's a great volume. Uh, that is just full of tremendous analysis and description, uh, but that when they finish it, they feel even more depressed than ever. Uh, and I guess we do make the case that the uh, right, uh, the far right, uh, is indeed ascendant in many, many parts of the world. Uh, it's a bit of a relief to know that in 2015 uh, we uh, pushed aside the proto-fascists in Canada after 10 years of uh, But the way we did it is a bit of a negative positive. Uh, I, I would, uh, before introducing uh, the panel, uh, all of whom have marvelous contributions in the volume, uh, I want to tell people, if they don't know, uh, that uh, Ellen Wood passed away last night. Uh, Ellen uh, was, of course, on the editorial collective of the Register for many years. Uh, helped me edit the first volume uh, after Ralph Miliband's death. Uh, contributed many essays to the Register. Uh, the first of hers, which was a critique of C.B. McPherson uh, and, and his approach to socialist political thought, uh, uh, led me to write a hostile response to her essay in uh, the 1980 register, I think, to which she wrote an even more hostile response. Um, her many essays in the register are well known, but probably the uses and abuses of civil society in the 1990 volume on the retreat of the intellectuals was uh, the greatest of them. Uh, it's a tragedy, of course, um, and, and uh, there's no replacing someone like Ellen Wood. Uh, leading off tonight will be two uh, brilliant young scholars who are contributing to the register for the first time. Uh, Rastu Sabera and Stefan Kipfer, uh, both in environmental studies at York. Uh, Rastu also teaches at Trent. Um, and they have a truly brilliant article comparing, and it grows out of work they've been doing uh, on this for some time, uh, comparing uh, the development of right-wing politics uh, and the way it is interpreted to the disadvantage of uh, immigrant working class communities very often uh, in both Paris and Toronto uh, and obviously they had a lot of fodder uh, both with the Ford administration here uh, but also with what's been going on in Paris vis-a-vis -vis the Ben Luz. Well thanks Leo and, and Greg for uh, getting us into this volume and doing all the work um, putting it together. I'm also not however terribly happy to sit here it's really, it is one of the most depressing thing, things to do, uh, to spend a lot of time thinking and researching about the hard right. But I think one can't really avoid doing so. I mean, certainly at a personal level, uh, I um, was in my late teens when the beginning of the rise of the Swiss People's Party began in Switzerland, and then lived in France in 1988, still under Mitterrand, but the Front National was already a national force then. And uh, the last time I lived in, in, in France, five years ago, of course, this was two years before the end of the regime of Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, one of the most vicious uh, characters in French, French political history, for sure. And of course, in Toronto itself, I mean, I, my arrival here in this country coincided almost exactly with the rise of the Reform Party into a national force in the late 80s and early 90s. 
and ended recently with Harper and Ford. So not happy times, but I think times that certainly require some engagement. Um, so when Barastu and I uh, got together to write this piece last year, or late 2014, uh, we were dealing with um, two places that we know reasonably well between the two of us, Paris and Toronto, France and Canada, to reflect on, a, on what was then a relatively recent resurgence of the heart right, so the, the, new, the populist heart right in France and Canada, and also the neo-fascist uh, right in, in France. Uh, a resurgence that uh, became evident, of course, here with the election of uh, Ford in 2010, Harper 2011, the majority government, and in France with the 2012 uh, presidential election, which, which saw the return of the Front National into a major position, and the more, more recent electoral victories of both wings of the right in France in three elections uh, in 2014 and 15. Of course, since we finished the piece in, I think, April, I think it was, right? Um, uh, the situation globally and, and in the places we've talked about has shifted again a bit, and Leo reminded us of the um, disappearance of Ford for the moment, and the rise of Trudeau in, in the Canadian context. In, certainly in the French case, however, um, you know, we've seen uh, an even uh, stronger role of the Front National in shaping French politics, um, which became evident very recently in the regional elections that followed the bombings in Paris in November, early December, the elections were in early December, when uh, the Front National uh, was a, a, actually uh, ended up um, becoming the, the, the first party in France in the first round of the regional elections for the first time. And we've also seen it in France, of course, with um, uh, the strategy of the socialist, quotation marks, socialist government, um, essentially implementing a program uh, responding to those bombings that was a program borrowed both from the bourgeois right and, and the Front National. Um, globally, of course, uh, we really do live in a constellation of fascist or proto-fascist politics and also various fascist producing dynamics and conditions. And uh, I don't need to remind you of the ongoing um, developments in India with the rule of the BJP, uh, the recent strategies of Turkey's uh, ruling party, AKP, starting a civil war to reestablish its, its uh, stranglehold over the national government. Uh, don't remind, need to remind you of the uh, presence of um, Donald Trump in the United States, um, and I could go on. And certainly the global constellation today and the specific cases we've looked at do reinforce two of the basic points that we make in our piece. Um, basic histor historical materialist and historical geographical materialist points, uh, which are the following, uh, and that is the first one being that any analysis of the hard right needs to analyze not only the specific organizations, ideologies, and strategies of the actual forces of the hard right, be they uh, populist, authoritarian, or fascist, and at the same time analyze the kind of conditions, the variegated conditions that have given rise to these specific forces, uh, both now but also over longer periods of time. The second point is that any such analysis between the manifestations of the hard right and the conditions that produce them uh, must not be static must avoid any static mechanical uh, arguments, but, but emphasize the dynamic relationships between the hard right and the conditions that produces them, uh, focusing on the historical transformations and the geographical unevenness, the comparative unevenness of, of hard right politics. So Barastu is going to uh, talk about 
the difficulty of investigating one such relationship between conditions and manifestations of the heart right, and that difficulty deals with, indeed, the, the challenge of uh, talking about and analyzing the support the heart right uh, may get or is claimed to get from various segments of the working class. And uh, once Parastu is finished, if there is some time, I may add another point. Uh, we'll see how it, how it goes. So as Isifan mentioned, uh, I'm going to briefly talk about one, uh, uh, one issue that we have focused in our, in our piece uh, in Socialist Register and is the phenomenon of subaltern support uh, for right populism. Um, which, is, uh, which is also a very turning question for the left uh, for, uh, for the fact that it is a reality, the reality that factions of non-white working class, non-white and white, uh, have been validating into, uh, towards right populist politics. Uh, but also importantly because uh, the liberal and also good factions of left are, have been analysts, have, uh, have been blaming um, working class and lately non-white working class um, for the rise of right populism, um, both in our geographical cases in Paris and Toronto. In, uh, and, and of course, to complicate the issue, the right populists themselves also um, have claimed that they are actually making new roads uh, uh, into working class uh, uh, spaces and making working class as the electoral uh, constituency. Um, and as Stefan briefly mentioned, um, our position is that uh, we shouldn't take um, the fact that uh, some aspects of right-wing politics uh, have had resonances with working class uh, as the uh, reality that working class are actually, the working class are actually a, a very solid and a static constituency of, of right-wing uh, right right populism. And the fact that, and, and, and we we're trying, we've tried, tried to talk about that, how uh, right-wing uh, right populist claims to working class uh, support is actually part of, part of the process of their intervention in uh, the complex uh, dynamics of socio-special restructuring in both Paris and Toronto since the 1980s. Uh, and of course in both, uh, in both cases, both in Paris and in Toronto, um, uh, suburban spaces have been crucial spaces and battlefields, electoral and political battlefields for, uh, for right-wing uh, right populists. Now, historically, in Marxist analysis, uh, 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 many Marxist analysts have stressed the fact that uh, the, and the crucial role of uh, socially vulnerable pedagogy uh, strata in uh, the formation of uh, uh, Bonapartism and fascist politics, um, either in um, sort of in alliance with monopoly capital in the case of fascism, or in alliance with local criteria in the case of Bonapartism. Um, since the 1980s, there are probably we can talk about two waves of, of, of discussions. Uh, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, the, there were the discussions about um, that the support of the working class is very much related to the sections of the working class that uh, are uh, happening and that were affected from the deindustrialization and they were from the deindustrial region, regions. Um, there were predominantly white working class in that in that case. Now, since 2010, uh, of course, attention has been shifted towards the uh, support of uh, non-white working class factions of non-white working class for right populists, and uh, that's 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 a complicated question, precisely because, of course, um, the, the the major question here is that. You know, how come racist and anti-immigrant and xenophobic anti pro parties are being so successful, or party successful, perhaps, in, uh, in attracting non-white working class? Um, now, one thing that we want, like, we emphasize is that, the although this is a reality, the reality that factions of, of non-white working class, working class in general, and non-white working class, have been gravitating towards white. Populism, both in 
highest region in Toronto region. Um, however, um, critical research uh, on this issue is actually um, is not um, is actually quite a sketchy. Um, and um, one thing that we have been trying to emphasize here is that uh, this phenomena is profoundly, uh, in fact, um, uh, shaped and mediated by a growing ter territorialization of politics uh, in both Toronto and Paris regions. And I'm going to uh, sh just shortly pour into one aspect of this territorialization of politics and what, I, what we mean by territorialization of politics and social life. So one of the one of the main sort of sort, sort of source of knowledge for uh, the claims that um, suburban spaces and working class in living in suburbs uh, that are dominant in both cases as a, a non white working class are the supporters or are being quite gravitating towards right wing politics is actually uh, polls and uh, and also electoral maps uh, of, uh, of whether polling data or election data. Uh, that very, very increasingly during the last several years, uh, maps actually have become uh, the scientific and objective way of reading politics. And sort of uh, politics increasingly, increasingly uh, is being read uh, uh, through maps, uh, not just in Toronto or Paris, but also, you know, when you look at the US, uh, uh, like there's no, also, like all the, all the discussions about politics now is actually going somehow through the medium of maps and mapping in terms of how we understand the geography, the geography, the geography of elections, and also the political dimension of that. Now that is um, that is in many ways very very problematic because what essentially is happening here is that um, maps are being taken as objective and neutral rather than uh, rather than being understood as 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 uh, uh, visual imaginaries that are profoundly profoundly ideological they much they might represent something of reality but they do represent they, they're not they're not uh, they're not the reality and the major problem of reading politics off maps is uh, in fact the reduction of uh, uh, the severe reduction most often of complex social special uh, transformation to some kind of need territorial territorial uh, territorially homogenized uh, categories of urbanity and suburbanity in our cases in the Paris region and Toronto region in a sense that uh, most arguments uh, about uh, the support of factions of working class for right populism always talks about uh, the vote coming from the suburbs. And that has been twittering somehow the civility and political uh, uh, progressive dimension of assumedly um, the, the you know, left politics of central Toronto, left the space of central, central Toronto or, uh, or central Paris and the global Paris. Um, so, what this territorial homogenized um, and essentialized uh, understanding of politics misses uh, is exactly the concrete reality and the deep interrelated um, uh, uh, relations of uh, class exploitation and racialized dehumanization and also patriarchal political domination uh, that the special segregation, this, that sort of like territorial politics between suburb and, 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 and the city and the urban, uh, the, the, the central city, and also relegating the working class to suburbs and people who are living in the suburbs actually mediates. Um, and as a result, what is happening is that increasing and increasingly our political visions uh, and, and social life has, uh, have also become territorialized. And we have taken that as, 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 as a normal fact and as sort of like it has been normalized. Um, one of the consequences of that is that, of course, uh, the essential distinction between populist and anti populist politics and anti populist uh, political landscape is, um, is being sort of understood as the absence of presence of urbanity. And here, urbanity 
it's quite un understood, quite in a very civilizational, uh, a civilizational um, a form as well. It is partly about density, but it's also about civilization and conception of what is diversity and, of course, essentialized and culturalized ways of uh, ways of life. And this is how being sort of like understood. Uh, that you know the working class is traditional, and it's because of their ways of life that is very much being affected by the physical spaces of suburb that they are that they are actually gravitating uh, to towards the right wing politics. Now, one of one, one one problem with such readings of politics of mass is precisely territorializing and essentializing politics. The other problem is that we also miss the very uh, reality. That such a territorialized region, uh, vision, sorry, uh, very much actually parallel. Uh, 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 the uh, ideologically is very much parallel. Uh, imperialist geopolitical visions of, of world politics in in terms of how spaces of uh, threat and terrorism fail, fail and failing state, uh, states and spaces of uh, the liberal democracy, peace. Are being understood, for example, in the works of uh, the, uh, 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 the imperialist uh, geopolit geopoliticians such as Mary Caldor, to uh, Robert Kaplan, uh, and also and also uh, Thomas Bennett, in terms of what are the space of threat in, 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 in international uh, scale and what are the spaces of uh, the spaces of peace. Um, and that's something that we talk about through our, through our piece in terms of uh, going through that and actually sort of highlighting the contradictions and, um, and the peace of uh, reading politics of maps uh, in relation to the support for, uh, factions, of work, uh, factions of working class for, um, uh, for right populism. And of course, the pitfall of environmental determinism that, that exists there, which also sort of like distract us from the major um, an actual question um, uh, in regard to working class um, spaces and subjectivity um, being a two important part, uh, two important um, questions. One being uh, and problems. One being the crisis of uh, uh, political representation. And, uh, and the other one being the difficulties that the left and the failures of the left of actually uh, making any kind of genuine uh, sort of connection to uh, and mobilization within these spaces. Thank you very much.